What's up, everyone? Welcome in a new edition of Celtics Beat. Adam, Evan, we're always here dancing our way on in. Abby Chin, NBC Sports Boston. Abby, I, I didn't actually look to see the last time that you were on the show. It hasn't been forever ago, but it's been a little while. Certainly the first time this year. It's good to see you. Is it the first time this year? Well, I mean, the season's only a few weeks underway. That's true. Didn't we speak in the off season? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Okay. Listen, don't don't <laughs> confuse don't confuse the amount that you're on the show versus the amount that we text. Obviously, <laughs> then it feels it probably feels like yesterday. I I just feel like since the pandemic, what is time? I have no idea when <laughs> things run together, and then the fact that the last season went till June, right? So then we're already in the summertime, sure. and it really only has been a few months. So not much of an off season, but, but that's how you'd pick it, right? Like that's that's what you want. That's why you're in this. Absolutely. And it was enough of an off season for me. I'm home with the kids all summer. So ready to get back out there. <laughs> like for the record, it went world. June 6th. The last Abby was last on June 6th. Ah. June 6th. Wow. So was that was that during the final? No, it was it was uh I believe at the well yeah, it's it's literally right at the end of the finals, I think. The because Eastern Conference finals. Okay. Before, before that, we had Bullpet on. And the title of the episode is What Edges Did the Celtics Have Over the Warriors? So that sounds like a finals preview. We knew who the yeah. matchup was going to be. Yeah. So, yeah, because right before that is the one I did with our buddy Seth, where I drank scotch the whole episode. Sure. You Just guys went for like two hours game. while I was at Disney yeah. World. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> well, that was that was this game seven preview, and I was a complete. Yeah. So oh, my was, gosh. Okay, so yeah. Was, so I, I remember I was sitting in my hotel room. Everybody's asleep after the fireworks and I pulled it up on YouTube and I'm just watching you guys drinking and going, uh, wondering if, if like the world was about to end. Basically, it was a rough. It was a rough time. Game sevens aren't fun unless your team's on them. No, we had to deal with two of them. Yeah. And like intense game seven. So, I do remember it. So the last time we were here, it was after game seven in Miami after Al Horford the Celtics did make it to the finals and Al Horford collapsed right in front of me in um, on the floor. And that was highly I remember emotional. That. I remember yeah. That. yeah. I was so pumped for Al just because that guy's worked so hard. I mean, he, he won a title with Florida, two titles of Florida, but to climb it, back, you know? he knows what it feels like I know. to get, to get back yeah. there. has taken so long yeah. for Al. And it's like, out of all the guys, and again, this year too, specifically, it's like, out of all the guys, like they got to do this for Al because there's just not many seasons like this left for Al in the tank. And they just, because he's, he's been such a steady, consistent, great player throughout his whole career. And, and that we've got to know him a little bit you now since he's been a Celtic now twice here. Uh, hard not to root for the guy. It's really hard. He's just constant professional. So well, he is not aging. I mean, 36 <laughs> years old right now. And he is a force out there. I mean, even last night, too, you could just see the leadership when. The Pistons were going on a run early and he just starts directing traffic and he's like, you go over there, you go there. We're fine. Just stick with the game plan. Be solid. Let's go. Look, what are we doing? Stop messing around. Um, so you haven't been on since June 6th, man. Did you, did you hear emails out? What? <laughs> I, I know. I, I, I hate to break news for you. It's, it's crazy. Wow. A lot has happened. You're yeah. Right. Yeah. Although, lots, lots it gone. Does feel like, last month. It does feel like, that didn't happen you know like that right. was a really that was a really rough little stretch maybe three to five days we had the press conference and then media day came and it's been smooth sailing ever since then it it has been nice other you know i i think so it's funny because the show that we did last week with washburn uh, and in aside from talking about the fantasy hoops league that hopefully you will jump in next year we uh you know it was all there was there was we won't do it this time around because we spent so much time last week but there was a lot of sort of just breaking down all the elements of Eme to the Nets. And now, of course, that's not happening. You know, they've, they've, you know, an about face gone with Jacques Vaughn, which uh, the about face is not totally surprising, but uh, going with Jacques Vaughn, if you're going to do the about face is not all surprising. One of the good guys in the NBA certainly earned the opportunity. The Nets have played better, uh, maybe not so coincidentally with him and without Kyrie Irving, which is a whole other thing. But he may is now sort of back to not being the Celtics problem per se, but back being, you know, on their payroll for future years until they work out this mutual parting and, and they, eventually do go their separate ways and he lands somewhere else. But the one sort of email aspect of things that I, I do want to ask you about before we, you know, talk about all the things that have gone well and gone right with this team since Joe has taken over is 
when everything came down just before training camp in those weird few days that you alluded to, how surprised, how taken aback were you by everything being, you know, obviously there, there was a lot of attention on the female members of the organization and female, you know, people that, that media and, and the like that are so closely associated with the organization like yourself, it, it had to be uh, interesting from a different angle for you than it was for a lot of us. Yes. Um, it's, it's been a while since I thought about this actually. Um, so it was, I was shocked, absolutely shocked. I had nothing but a professional positive relationship with Ime and, and never had any questions um, about anything in his behavior or mm -hmm. anything like that. Um, but I do. So I remember Wednesday, it was a Wednesday night at around 10 30. Uh, the Woj tweet broke and I'm watching TV with my husband and I was like, what is this? And I started texting. I texted Forsberg. I texted a bunch of people. Forsberg was passed out. He didn't text me back till the next morning, <laughs> by the way. Oh, sorry to blow up your spot, Forsberg. Uh, but, and, uh, and then, you know, and trying to figure out what it was. And then um, I had no idea. And then the Shams tweet drops and just the way that was worded, mm -hmm. um, that it was someone within the organization. Uh, and so immediately on Twitter, my name started popping up and I, and you know, the reality is I, I do not work for the organization. Um, and it was a little horrifying. And then I can't imagine what people in the organization were going through Amanda Flugrad and I mean, Allison Feaster, and mm -hmm. all of that with their pictures and their names out there and everywhere. Um, I feel like two things. I, so I went to the next morning I'd been awake. I'm just on my phone constantly, but, um, the next morning I take my kids to school and I was talking to our next door neighbor who, uh, works with, um, nonprofits. She's, she's not in the sports world at all. And I tried to explain to her the situation and she's like, Oh, that's so crazy. But also, you know, not, she just didn't. And I was like, no, no, they think that I'm involved. And she's like, what, why would someone do that? Like, really? And cause she was just like, why are you so involved in this? Why are you so upset? And, uh, and I, she's like, Oh, Oh no, that's, that's, yeah, that's not right. <laughs> so <laughs> it was kind of, um, interesting to get an outside perspective. And then, um, you know, the time just went on and you're just waiting for them to say something or waiting for some sort of response from the team themselves. And, um, nothing came that whole day. And I was just, I just remember being tied to my phone. Like, what is happening? Um, but I think, you know, obviously for legal reasons, they couldn't do anything, say anything. They were working out what was going to happen. Um, and in negotiations and all of that all day, I just, the other thing that I was going to say is I feel like, unfortunately, um, I'm pretty used to that. You know, I'm, I'm used to trolls and on social media. It is not, um, completely foreign for someone to assume that I am sleeping with a member of the staff, a player or something like that. I mean, no matter how untrue it is, that's not unheard of for people to say those things and assume those things or just think those things. And so, um, it didn't affect me that much, the rumors or any, um, my name out there at all. I felt bad for the people in the organization, the, the women who, you know, um, you just pull up the directory and you're like going down the list of everyone who's listed on as a member of the Celtics organization. And, and those are, you know, people who have been anonymous in the past and have no reason for their name to be dragged out there. And so, um, I felt really bad for them. And I, it was just one of those really ugly days on social media. And, um, I'm glad that it's over for now. It feels like it's over. I don't know how you ever come back from that, but, um, yes, sadly, I think that it, I was not that affected by it because, you know, I'm used to dealing with those kinds of things, but also, um, I do, I don't like that. I think a casual fan, if they're just kind of like, Oh, Hey, what, what happened to Ime? Oh, he got, you know, he's suspended for, an inappropriate relationship. And I just, just, I just feel like the casual fan will just assume like, Oh, it's probably the sideline reporter, you know, like right. obviously. And so I feel like that will 
be out there forever. Let's talk about basketball. Let's talk about the fun stuff, obviously, because I think the email distraction is uh, going to become less so over the course of time. But what you do have is an increasingly strong buy-in in Joe Missoula. You're certainly closer to him than than Evan and I are. You know, you get an opportunity to chat with him and interview him, and and he just seems like such a a, a good, you know, solid guy. Great, you know, m- maybe more engaging in, in terms of the the personality, more affable, more self-deprecating. Sort of very Brad Stevens like versus you know Ime, who put on kind of a strong front, and you know, I'm sure. It, a perfectly nice guy, but at least in the media didn't come across as extremely personable. You know what I mean? It was kind of all he business all the time. He may has a sense of humor and it's funny and can be funny. Yeah. Um, I just don't think that maybe we saw it as much. I'm not doubting it's there, uh, but it's, it maybe wasn't as obvious as someone like Joe. Um, I will say, so I, I covered Joe when I covered the, summer league for NBA TV a couple of years ago when he was the Mm. head coach of the summer league team. Um, and then obviously traveling with the team. So, so I knew him a little bit. Um, but I was blown away you guys on media day talking to him and just how, um, not overwhelmed he was, he was, he was not intimidated by the situation. He was excited about the opportunity ready for this moment and um just so confident and and sure in everything that he was doing and from my first conversation with him at media day i was like oh they're gonna be fine this is this is like brad when brad said that when he felt like they had someone in the organization or he knew immediately they had someone in the organization um at that press conference after i talked to joe i understood and believed him and it has been like that ever since um and he is just obviously the basketball stuff is there he has the basketball knowledge the um the mind for the game the relationships that he has built with the players over his time in boston is there but yes adam like you said he he is funny and he is self-deprecating and he is okay with us i mean i did an entire hit when we were in New York about his gum and chewing his gum. And I asked him about it before. I'm like, I want to talk about your gum. Can you tell me about it? And he, the, the, the thing about him though, is that he doesn't want the story to be about him. He wants the light, the spotlight to shine on his players. And you hear that in every press um, interaction that we have. He, he wants the light. He wants the story to be about the players, but he is part of that story. And so, um, but I did ask him about the gum and he, and he said, yeah, you know, I, I, I've always chewed gum. I've always chewed gum this ferociously. It's just that no one cared before because I was on the back of the bench. No one could see me. What amazes me, he only uses two pieces. Well, so I was just going to say, I like, yeah. if I, you know, while I was describing him before, if I were to add one more adjective to describe Joe Mazzula, liar, because he is, there's no chance. There is no way in hell that man is chewing one piece of gum per half. And like, and, so, and, and as, know, as, he, as he you put it, it as ferociously as he does it it loses flavor after six seconds abby i agree and that i i go through a piece of gum like every 20 minutes but he right. um he said he has one per half he adds a second so he's got two in his mouth for the second half uh-huh. the gum is pure p-u-r is the brand because i guess he said malcolm brogdon turned him onto it because it doesn't have any aspartame which I've been meaning to Google that and I just haven't. Um, so maybe because it's like some pure gum, maybe it hangs onto its flavor better. I don't know, but that's what he told me. But that's what I mean. And and Joe is just, um, he's fine with us talking about that because he doesn't want the attention. He doesn't want people to think that he, he doesn't, I mean, you know, everyone's got an ego, but he, he doesn't have this huge ego where he wants it, he wants to be at the forefront of what's happening. So, yeah, one yeah, one of the like things it. that I noticed the other day with Jalen, I think it was yesterday a quote came out about how, you know, some days he doesn't want to talk to to anybody. You know, everybody has those days where you feel a little introverted and you got maybe some stuff going on in your head. You don't want to talk about it. And Missoula is like, no, 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 we're going to talk about this. And then he has a conversation with, with the coach and he ends up feeling way better about that. How do you feel the dynamic so far? Again, part of being a head coach is calling the right plays and getting the right defense set up and knowing when to call timeouts. Um, but another part of it is, is kind of like nurturing a little bit. And Joe, it's, it's interesting because again, I remember watching Joe Mazzullo play college basketball and he is two years older than me and he's in charge of grown men, Al Horford, obviously older than him, um, in terms of like nurturing guys and, and checking in on guys where their mental health is, or their physical health is, how is he managing that particular part of the, of it so far, Abby, in your estimation? 
Um, as far as I can tell, great. One of the things that I really appreciate about Joe is his humility. And that's one of the things he said the first day was that I know that I don't know everything and I am not afraid to ask. I want to have these conversations. I want you to tell me, give me your input. I want us to work together as a true team. But you bring up Jalen Brown and um, mentioning the previous relationships that he has. So Joe last year um, took it upon himself to bring in Jalen going through some film sessions and just kind of going through places, showing, pointing out places where he feels like he can improve, where defenses are attacking him or where he's sliding on defense. And um, at Joe's suggestion, he said, Jalen, why don't we bring other people in your teammates you're on the floor with let's go through. And, and Joe prepared every piece of film that they looked at um, and really helped Jalen to see the game in a different way. And he's the one who told us those stories on media day. So those relationships are there. And, and, and Joe has proven himself to these guys, I think repeatedly. I mean, and Chris Forsberg has a story that when Derek White, arrived after the trade deadline, Ime just said, go talk to Joe. He'll get you all set up on our defense. And it was Joe who in indoctrinated um, Derek in the, you know, intricate defense that the Celtics are running that is not easy to do. And so there has been a lot of trust in Joe, I think, from the beginning. And um, there's no question in my mind, the players believe in him. And I feel like over the last few games, he's had a different command. Um, one, you know, he's clearly not afraid to make changes, moving Grant Williams into the starting lineup uh, because for defensive purposes, I mean, and Grant, while he has not been an offensive juggernaut, uh, defensively checking Ja Morant and then Kate Cunningham was not good yesterday. Uh -huh. um, or whatever day, what day of the week? Yeah, was yesterday. He started like night. over yeah. nine. Yeah. Like right. yeah. I mean, Kate Cunningham looked like a shell of himself. I went to pissed and shoot around yesterday excited to talk about Cade Cunningham and then he did nothing in the game so I had to change my entire report because I couldn't talk about how good of a season he's having um but so you know he's not afraid to make adjustments he's not afraid to make changes he's not afraid to and that was Ime's strength right is holding these guys accountable calling them out when it's necessary and um he did that last night at halftime called those guys to task for letting the pistons run all over <laughs> well, pull down rebounds all over them. And so, and then you saw a completely different team, particularly a different Jason Tatum in the second half. So while he doesn't admonish the players publicly, like he may did, I, I do believe he's holding them accountable in the locker room. And, and I believe Jalen, when he says we believe in Joe. So Jalen, one of his post-game quotes that I, I thought was really interesting was, and and I just, I, I enjoy listening to him talk, but one of the things that I thought was interesting was that he said through his first, you know, 11 games of the season now, and the team is winning, they're eight and three, but he's not all that happy, all that satisfied with his personal play. And I look at it and I, I see a guy who's averaging better than 25 points a game, hauling down almost seven rebounds. He's shooting what, 46% from the field. I know the three point percentage is a little bit lower than he would like the, the free throw percentage. I, I, I'm old enough to remember when Jalen Brown couldn't hit a free throw. He's shooting like 85, 86%, whatever it is from the free throw line. He did miss the, been, the one for the tech last night. Yeah, yeah. And I know. <laughs> Look, nobody's perfect, Abby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we know that as well as anybody on this show that nobody's perfect, but he's, yeah. uh, you know, he's having a, a really good year, an all-star caliber year. I, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he could even get into the all NBA, not first team, but all NBA conversation at some point in time, depending on how things progress. But, um, and, and you know, you'll still have people point out, well, he's still turning the ball over three times a game or whatever, but overall, and maybe that's what Jalen looks at because I see a guy who's, who's had a, a really strong season to this point. So what did you take away from those comments and sort of, where do you think he can take his game to a, a place where he is happy? I was, standing right next to him. And I agree with you. I was a little taken aback by those comments. He did finish it by saying, but we're winning. So everything's fine. <laughs> he said, you know, I'm not unhappy with my role, but it is a different role. And I think he is trying to find ways to be aggressive and whatever he's doing, it's working, right? Like you said, I mean, he's had how many games where he scored 30 points, 30 plus. Mm -hmm. And, um, Joe did, I mean, last night drew up a play for Jalen and it's not like Joe has completely gone away from Jalen when he feels the game needs it. He knows where to turn. And so I think it's 
um, some things to keep an eye on for sure. The fact that Jalen wanted to bring that up unprovoked, but um, clearly, I mean, they have the number one rated offense in the league, put up another 128 points last night. Jalen is averaging, like you said, near his career highs. And so I think that it is, um, to me, it feels like the offense under Joe is different. Uh, talking to guys last night, the whole, there's been so much emphasis on spacing and running to your spots and getting to the, be in the right places at the right time. Um, that it it's, they're still developing those habits is my point. And so I think that the offense somehow is only going to get better from here. And then that maybe will open up even more opportunities for Jalen, but there's no question right now. It's very point guard heavy. And that's what they talked about last night. And um, Marcus smart and Malcolm Brogdon have the ball in their hands a lot. And it's looked good so far. I think that once, because they have so much versatility and they can play so many different ways, I think, I do think there will be opportunities for Jalen. I think that Joe is just trying to build these habits now. So then you can build off of them going forward. An offense, by the way, that is a freaking juggernaut 11 games into the year. First in the NBA, Uh, first in the NBA, uh, about almost 120 uh, offensive efficiency or offensive rating right now, uh, which is just, it, it's incredible to watch. Let's, uh, Abby, go back to the MVP conversation uh, a little bit and talk about Jason Tatum. Because- Hang on, before we dive into that, I do want to, I just want to just get both of your opinions on something because I'm I'm just curious. Sure. So the Celtics have the best offense in the NBA through 11 games. It's super fun to watch. The question for both of you is, does it feel gimmicky? Because like sometimes you go back to those Rockets, Harden teams, and like they had this unbelievable offense, but it was really gimmicky. It was like Harden does everything. It's threes and layups, and that's it. It it doesn't feel like something that will hold up in the playoffs, although they got very, very close with Chris Paul and Harden facing what was probably the best team we've ever seen uh, between the the Durant and Warrior uh, Warriors, uh, Durant and Curry Warriors. There we go. Does this feel offense feel gimmicky? Or does it feel like a legitimate like equal opportunity offense here? Because I'm trying to fe- – it kind of vacillates between both, in my opinion. So I, I think – and I'll, I'll let Abby go. I'll be quick. I think that between the two, I think it's less gimmicky and more Splash Brothers. You know, uh, uh, in a weird way, your Splash Brothers are Sam Hauser and Grant Williams. But, you know, I, I think that you've, totally got a, a, you've got a deep, versatile offense uh, with this team that, that to me doesn't feel gimmicky at all. But, uh, Abby, by all means. No, I – Completely agree. I don't think it feels gimmicky in that. I mean, the only similarities, I think Jason Tatum getting to the line at the rate that he's getting to, um, but he's Long time coming. with all the new rules. Yeah. That we're talking about. And, and like I was just talking about, I think that with the versatility, they can play so many different ways that there is, there's so much room to grow for this offense. Like this, this is just the beginning. They're establishing the foundations for what is to come. Um, and so I think that I'm excited about the offense. I, I didn't realize how much more could be tapped out of that. But when you look at, they have two of the best players in the league in Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, and then what you can do around that, not to mention adding in the Malcolm Brogdon piece. And I'm, we're still waiting for an update on that hamstring. I'm sure we mm-hmm. won't get one until um, pregame on Friday. But um, I think that there's so much more to unlock. And, and like like we were just talking about, Jalen Brown being a primary ball handler, running some pick and rolls himself and, and that kind of stuff. I think that um, the only thing that gives me pause when you're talking about that, Evan, is that a lot of their – they want to play with so much pace and, and get out and transition – I want to see them more in the half court and what they can do in those kinds of sets. But, you know, the, the cutting, there's been more cutting, there's been delayed cutting and and there's even more stuff that you can do with that. So um, no, I'm nothing but excited about the offense. I think last night too, was a really good sort of example of what we're talking about in terms of like the first half, of course, by the end, Jalen or Jason Tatum was still the leading scorer. He had he met his season average with 31 points and he got hot. He had that ridiculous start to the third quarter that was just mesmerizing on both ends of the floor. I mean, it's as, as strong a like five minute period as, as he's probably had in his entire career against Detroit there. But let's remember that at halftime, they were still up reasonably big, whatever the score was on the Pistons, who are a bad team, I realize, but they're up, you know, they've got a, a, a sizable lead. Team. Yeah. 
Yeah, they've got they've got a sizable lead though, and Tatum really didn't do much in the it's first half. It was, yeah, it was it was Jalen leading the way. Hauser was electric off the bench. You know, Brogdon before he got hurt was was playing really well. Smart's racking up the assists again. So you were seeing the balance, the versatility that we're talking about. Like I, I'm more often than not, because he is your best player and and a top five player in the NBA. At, at least most people would probably put him right there right now. Jason Tatum is going to be the guy, but it was sort of telling that, all right, well, maybe at least some of these lesser than teams, he doesn't always have to be. And and I think that's noteworthy. I also think it's really, I mean, if we want to get into the Jason Tatum conversation, we need to talk about what he's doing on the defensive end and the effort that he is playing, the buy-in that he has and, and how that then trickles down to everyone else on the team. And it makes such a huge difference. I mean, you know the kind of athlete he is, the fact that he's applying and the way that he applies himself on that end of the floor changes the game as well. And so that's been really cool and fun to watch. And I know that the defense has not been a strength of this team just yet, but I think that that is indicative of how far they have to grow. And that's also exciting. And, 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 and then Rob, climbing, by the way. we haven't talked about Rob Williams on my shirt. Twist. Yeah, I didn't uh, even notice that. It's a good Rob, shirt. Yeah, to Rob in New York before the Knicks game, and uh, that's a. From the I thought it was a scary Terry T-shirt at first. Oh, I no. Rob Williams. That's amazing. It's How many shirt. of those are in circulation? I don't know, I don't but know. I got one from uh, yes, Celtics PR man. Legend, 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 legend. Yeah, legend. legend. absolutely, legend. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, but we haven't even talked about Rob and just what uh, getting Rob back and having that sort of safety net on the back line. I mean, that's what is going to bring this Celtics defense back to what it was the season ago. So I feel like yeah. right now that that side of the ball, they're just treading water, and Jason Tatum doing as much as he can. Well, we missed an opportunity just to get off topic for one second. We missed an opportunity to rehash one of my favorite quotes, maybe in sports history. And that is Rob Williams talking about his favorite holiday movies, saying that his favorite holiday movie is any Michael Myers movie. <laughs> it's the funniest, funniest quote I think I've ever heard in my entire life. And I'm so upset that we didn't get to, to like, because whoever runs that particular part of like Southern Spring in, like in game entertainment is amazing. Uh, and I want more. I like. Want, I want more like Rob deep dive like Halloween Michael Myers stuff like for next season because it's just. I'll that is, keep that in mind. Yeah, if we talk to him around Christmas time, I'll ask. Yeah, it's just, that, Evan. it's, it's yeah. one of my favorite. The, the the video. Every somebody took a video of it on their phone, and every I time it's around, around they, start, they start laughing because they know what's coming. And it, every time it gets me. It gets me every time. I love Rob so much. And all of those. There's one that just makes you go hmm. And then, <laughs> Rob crushed it on that one. No question. <laughs> Sorry to get us off topic. My fault. No, it's but it's, it's I miss Rob. That's all. I miss the guy. Yeah. He had the Alan Chaga hat on last last game. I thought it was great. Good to see him out there. Um Marcus with uh and and it's it's been a good year for him, I think, overall, but in particular these last few games where you know we're we're so accustomed to talking about the you know hashtag winning plays and all the effort and uh defensive player of the year, all of that stuff. But Marcus Really, last year for the first time under Ime, um, in terms of any sort of consistent way, thrust into a true point guard role, you know, where it's not just always oh, playing point guard or he's, you know, off ball or he's at the two or what, like he was truly entrusted to be this team's point guard post Kyrie Irving, post Kemba Walker. You're the guy, Marcus. You've been waiting for the opportunity very openly. It's yours. Run with it. You look at these last few games and the assist to turnover ratio, 34 to four, these last three games. And it's not going to go like that forever. Clearly, it's not going to be, you know, 11 and one, 11 and two every single day. But I think we've got a lot of these in our future as well. I think he's just he's made a transition in his game, not just as a distributor, obviously, and, and was putting on a passing clinic the other night. Some of those highlights were incredible. If you haven't seen the the real floating around that NBA, uh, the NBA Twitter, NBA.com, whatever put out, but the protection of the basketball after the team smart included was so careless throughout that playoff run, especially in the finals last year, just that renewed message of protecting the ball and, and what it's done for his game in particular. There was, 
And you're right. The last few games, I think, has been we've seen a different Marcus. And I think that there's no question to start the season. He was searching for something in this offense and, and couldn't find his shot. He was typical Marcus, as we know, impacting the game in other ways defensively and um, with his hustle. But I think that pretty recently, and I asked Joe this last night, Joe challenged him to be the distributor, take control, run this offense, take the keys and go. And he clearly received that message. And, and we know Marcus has that basketball IQ. He's been able to make, I mean, he, he makes amazing passes all the time. So he, I feel like he has just kind of honed in on that for these last handful of games. And then you're seeing the results. And so once he, and I feel like I keep going back to this, but so once he gets that habit in, and then that becomes the, that becomes the baseline, right? Those 11 to 12 assists become the baseline every night. And then you can build off of that. And then he gets really comfortable in that role. And then the three start falling and then who knows what's going to happen. So I do think it's something that Joe challenged him to focus on. He, you know, rightly or not, the way I was thinking about it is kind of um, that, and Adam, you know, the Berenstein Bears book about manners <laughs> and bad yes. habits. And uh, brother and sister, like, oh, we're gonna, Mama, Mama Bear's gonna be so upset because we're gonna go over the top with our manners, and they're just like, please and thank you everywhere. And um, so eventually, you just like build back into just being polite in general. You know, <laughs> you go over the top for a week, and then you fall back to being in general. And so I think that that's kind of where Marcus is at with that part of his game, and. I think that's a good thing. And this is going to help him and help the team going forward. Can I just tell you more parent talk here, Abby? Mm -hmm. I, I have, I have, I have looked, I have searched, I have done a deep dive trying to find Berenstein bears just streaming somewhere because it was such a great show you. when it, it there, but there it's, it's hard to find like, a, is not good. No, the qual no, I want to like, I want to go to prime or I want to go to Netflix or one of those like yeah. whatever Nick stations. And I want it because the kids have seen a couple, they like the books. I want more Berenstein bears in my life. Yes. I, um, I'm sorry, Evan, we, we, uh, show. I went to a, before the pandemic, I went to a live nope. Berenstein bears performance at the native mall. I had no idea that was a thing. And I left something to be desired. So <laughs> I, I'm a little, I'm, I'm happy for the books. <laughs> Thanks, grateful for uh, the books. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel like the, like, sort of, the, I don't know, there are a lot of good kid shows. There are a lot of terrible ones too. Bluey is probably the closest thing that you have to a Berenstein Bears right now. That was my question. I, what is the Bluey situation in either household? Because apparently that's a really, I don't know anything about it. I just know it's popular. So you should put it on. It's it's fun for adults too, Evan. And they is have it? accents. So it's always just nice to listen to. They're Australian, them. right? Is that what yeah. They are? yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. Um, my son thinks Bluey is hilarious. He's three and a half. So it's like just become a thing in our house and he, it cracks him up so much. It's so fun <laughs> yeah that's a good one you got to try that uh what are the big city greens on on disney plus is another one you can you can look up if you haven't uh all right how about uh, I'm, i think i'm stealing this from celtics blog maybe i saw this on twitter i'm taking it from somewhere we can you know move over zappy fever and hello hauser mania yeah. sam hauser has just been it i mean better by the day obviously as as he gets entrusted to to have a bigger role he's now averaging 8 points in about 15 minutes a game he is a clear part of this rotation he's getting an opportunity he's hitting uh, i was looking it up 58% of his shots 53% from three point range his assist to turnover ratio going back to Marcus Smart Hauser's assist to turnover ratio is 6 which is best on the team he has been Within his role, like he's not going to be an all-star or something, but within his role, he has been exceptional. And I, I go back to, you know, like Brad used to say this all the time, like be be a star in your role. Sam Hauser is a star in his role right now for this team, and it's making a difference. Absolutely. I go back to Joe Mazzula last night. They were asking, what did what has Sam done to show you, to for you to trust him? And he said, make all of his shots. <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> that's what he's yeah. done that, that's been the key because I mean the reality is up until this point he was a liability on defense and teams are still even the Pistons last night are targeting him whenever he's on the floor so he needs to be able to at the very least hold his own and hold him guard his yard enough for the help to come behind him um, and then as long as you can do that 
as, and then make your shots, yes, you're going to get more playing time. Um, I think what Sam is showing us and, and Grant as well is just how good the shooting is on this team right now, something that the Celtics have been searching for for years, but then also how good it is across the league. I mean, offenses are up across the league. That's something we didn't talk about with this defense. I think that it's just the scoring, the shot making, the the decision making is just on another level, it feels like so far this season. And so um, Sam, no question adds to that is basketball IQ and the players love him. Like the players are really Jason Tatum a week ago or so was talking about how Sam um, just to his development, you can see it out there and he dribbled into a blitz and um, off of a DHO dribble handoff and then pulled back and then passed it into Luke Cornett who drew a foul. And um, in Jason's words, he said, he told Sam, now you're playing basketball. And so it is um, his game is developing. He's hitting his shots. And I think it's, it's also really shows you going from year one to year two. And then what you can do once you know that you are going to have regular playing time and you're not going to have that hook come for you after you miss that first shot. So um, all of that wrapped into one, but it sure is fun to watch. And I'm, and I'm, I am trying to make the human torch happen. Um, <laughs> I think I'm alone in that. But I'm just, we can help. We can I try and help. on Twitter all the time. So that's what I'm doing. I mean, cel sunshine. celebrate the six microwave. I like torch. Yeah. He's okay. fire. I mean, the timing is good. You know, Chris Evans was recently named the People Magazine Sexiest Man of the Year. Mm. You know, we can, we can sort yeah, of America, put it all in together, right? The house doesn't look like Chris Evans like at all. Yeah. No, but he was the human torch. Yeah, but you're you're really oh, trying the, too hard, I think. And I think the Fantastic Four, the Fabulous Four? No, Fantastic yeah. Four, yeah. The the original, uh, the, the, the first, like, bust it's Fantastic really, It's really four. bad. It's really bad. Oh. Yeah. Comically. Jessica Alba, it wasn't that bad, Evan, yeah. but it was a long time ago. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Really yeah, not good enough to catch on like the rest of the Marvel universe. No, they're, 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 there's a reason they're redoing it a third time with a totally different cast again. But uh, I don't know. Okay. Hauser does need some sort of like nickname that has to do with like, I don't know. I He just reminds Isn't me. Just something as like stupid and simple as like Hauser Matic. I don't know, something. Don't know. But he reminds me of Steve Novak. And like people might not even know who that is. But Steve Novak for the Knicks yeah. in the Knicks, mid yeah. to late aughts was an absolute flamethrower before like the Steph Curry generation of we're all taking eight threes a game. Like he was, yeah. shooting, I was going to blast line just to check one year. I think it was 08, 09 or 09, 010, 47% from three on five attempts a game. Like that's a huge valuable piece. And having that on your offense makes everybody's life easier. I mean, just the amount of space they're able to play with, like it's no coincidence that the lineup of him and Brogdon and Tatum and two other bench guys is killing people. Like going into last night, I think Hauser had the highest plus minus on the team. And I would assume it's probably held steady, although I don't know. Um, but it's not, it's like not a, a coincidence. Like it's like, I think Scal mentioned it a few games ago when boss, I don't, and I don't remember the exact game because everything now is just compiling into one thing, but he was mentioning how well the unit of Tatum plus Brogdon plus the bench was playing. And a big part of that is because Sam Hauser offensively, you have to check him. You can't just, it's not like Tatum covering Brandon Clark the other night where he just can cover Brandon Clark, but leave him over there and kind of play help defense as the Rover as much as you want. If you rove defense away from Sam Hauser, he's going to hit three shots in a row that, all of a sudden you either are uh, in a close game and now it's uh, it's it's a comfortable lead for Boston or you had a comfortable lead and it's gone. Like Sam Hauser, I cannot believe that we are here, but like the, this team took a huge leap just by adding one extremely competent shooter and has changed the trajectory of their offense. And, and I didn't think it would be Sam Hauser. I thought it might be, you know, a bigger leap from Tatum or somebody, but like this is – it's remarkable what has happened. Or Gallo had he been healthy? That's the crazy thing too. Like no Gallo. I mean, is, again, I forget this line all the time. You think Gallinari knows who Wally Pip is? Because I, I don't think so. I think Didn't we might Gallo have... get a two year contract too. Like yeah. listen, they're gonna get in each other's way next year. Gallo's probably he might never play in a Celtics uniform. It's definitely something to talk about for sure. Obviously not now, but like I don't know because that was supposed to be his role. And Hauser is. It does. It's another one. Model. 
it's another one that the Celtics front office was like, we're going to be fine. We have Sam and, and people are skeptical until you see it out there on the floor. And, um, the gala thing is interesting. I thought about that or I heard it on a podcast, I think yesterday driving the shoot around was that Sam fits almost better than Gallo would number one, cause he's younger. So he's hungrier, you know, he, and he's going to, and defensively he's still maturing and, and only going to improve. And so it is, he fits really well with this team, with that group in particular, like you said, cause I mean, the space on the floor with that, with, him in the corner, Grant in the corner, and then Jason Tatum and Malcolm Brogdon going to work. I mean, it doesn't matter who that fifth person is out there with them. Um, and then with Sam in particular, I don't know. It's just, he is, so, he's also really humble and like, but not afraid to assert himself and, and talk smack when it's necessary to. So like he had a moment in the, um, the game before the Knicks, whoever that was, I need to look at my schedule where he, obviously he was just on fire hitting threes. And after one of them, he said, boom, not safe for work. And, uh, so, <laughs> and maybe that was in the Knicks game afterwards in the locker room, Jason Tatum was like, yeah. yo, you need a celebration. Like, I know that's not going to be it. Cause that's just not really who you are, Sam, <laughs> but <laughs> he does have that. He has that fire. He has that intensity inside him. And, um, obviously that comes out on the court and you just, you knew he could make shots. The Celtics have drafted guys who can shoot. It's a matter of doing it when it matters in the game. And he, and he can do that. He's proving that he can do that. And it's opened up a lot for them, particularly in those bench units. I don't know how long it'll be the case, but a fun fact for people, Sam Hauser ranks second on the team, obviously beyond Jason Tatum, but second on the team in uh, PER player efficiency rating. That is how impactful he has been to start off this year so far. I remember the other thing I was going to say was that Joe last night said, typically good shooters make good screeners. And when I asked Sam about that, he said, yeah, because if you, if I screen someone, my defender has to stay with me, you know, so it gets the defense in motion um, because you can't let Sam Hauser go. Can't let him roam. Don't let him get hot. Who would have thought? Who would have thought <laughs> during Hauser. all those summer conversations of how do you replace Danilo Gallinari? Don't let Sam Hauser get hot. It's amazing. It's been a, thing, though. It's been a lot of fun. You know, it's the real thing. Eight and three. Uh, and I, I will say this for as long as it's the case. And maybe this comes to an end against the Nuggets and, and they suffer, you know, a, a real loss. And, and what I mean by that is this is a team that could be 11 and 0. You know, the, the two losses uh, in overtime to the Cavs and then one where they blew a 19 point lead in Chicago. Okay. They could very well be perfect right now. Uh, so uh, and, and I'm going to maintain that I'm going to I'm going to beat that drum until they suffer a real loss, like a, a loss that. All right. You know, you're, you're just down by 10 or 15. You never quite recover and we, whatever. We all know what it looks like. But that is how good so far this team has been to begin the year. And it's had to be because, as we know, the Eastern Conference is very, very deep and some teams that have started off very slow like the nets like the sixers are theoretically going to rebound and uh you know emerge and water will find its level and all of that so pick up these wins while you can obviously because it's going to get more challenging uh the uh the schedule and like i said maybe Denver's you know, coming to town on Denver. friday yeah that could be rough with Jokic. so i'm curious to see how that goes it's good to have you back on the podcast abby for having me guys anytime as long that's as you not, keep wearing not, Swiss t-shirts. Four or five months again I know. I can't, I can't believe. I guess we were just nice. We let you enjoy your summer. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tried to do our part. More more time for Berenstein Bears reenactments. Abby, uh, enjoy. And uh, we will not make it five months. We will have you on here again, maybe even before the new year. And we look forward to it. And uh, we'll we'll talk fantasy basketball with you so much that you will either tire of it or say, man, I got to be part of that league next year. What do you think people hate more talking about your own fantasy team or talk analogies about the bird team bears that's toss up that yeah. is that's that's close <laughs> yeah and we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna really digest that over the next week until we have our next show we'll come back with an answer for evan for abby i'm adam thanks for being with us this has been celtics beat we'll see you later 